What's up everybody, it's Dan from SageMathTutoring.com and I have another test prep uh, video for you guys. This has to do with the contemporary mathematics test for Excelsior College, which um, I have a student who's uh, um, involved in that and she's going to be taking a test soon. So here are some practice questions from the review sheet. Anyway, let's get right to it. What is the next number in this pattern? Well, 8, 15, 29, 57, 113. So it looks like we're going up by multiples of 7, doesn't it? So from here to there is 7. From here to here is 14. From here to here is 28. From here to here is... I don't know, you know, at this point it's 56, which makes me think there must be another pattern, which I can kind of see right now actually, in the sense that what you're doing is you're adding to each number um, one less than the current number. So one less than eight is seven, and seven plus eight is 15. One less than 15 is 14, and 14 plus 15 is 29. One less than 29 is 28, and 28 plus 29 is this. Uh, 1 less than 57 is 56, and 57 plus 56 is that. So 1 less than 113 is going to be 112, and 113 plus 112 equals, that would be 225. Bam. That's how you do that one. All right, so this one, let P and Q represent the following simple statements. P means dog bark q means cat's meow which of the correspond which corresponds to the symbolic statement okay so my student should know at home <clears throat> pardon me that uh this little squiggly line means not p the um v means or all right now if it was an upside down v then that would mean and but this v means or so Really, what we're saying is not P or Q. All right, now since P means dogs bark, Q means cats meow, then basically means uh, dogs don't bark or cats meow. All right, so that's this one. Boom, not too bad. All right, in one game, a basketball team took 95 shots. The team made 12 of its 15 free throw attempts worth one point each, 30 out of the 68 two-point shot attempts, five out of 12 three-point shot attempts, which piece of information is unnecessary in determining the number of points the team scored? Well, if we wanna know, you know, which piece of information is unnecessary in determining the number of points the team scored, apparently we are really paying attention to the number of points the team scored and it's definitely the case that we really don't need to know how many attempts were made right we really don't know how many attempts were made we need to know how many um, points were scored you know or baskets were made we could say right we need to know this stuff and of course we need to know what kind of shot it was so you know how many points you get for each of these 12 uh, shots you know, made, that's 12 times one, so that's 12 points, this would be 60 points, and this would be 15 points, but we don't really need to know the attempts, right? So, let's see, the number of shots taken, that right here is unnecessary, because we're mostly interested in how many shots were made, not taken. All right, so... The number of three punch shots made. Okay, looks like we did that correctly. All right, moving on. So if the US population increases by one percentage point per year and the population is currently at this, what will the population be in two years? Okay, so it increases by one percentage point, right? So that means that, you know, if you have a population the next year, you're going to take 1% of that population, and that's going to be added on top of um, 
you know, next year's population. And then you're going to take 1% of that population, and then you're going to add that on top of the next year's population, if that makes sense. And the way to go about this one, algebraically at least, there's probably different ways that you could do it, but uh, one thing you could do is you could find out, you know, seeing as how we are dealing with 310 million, you could take into account, you know, what you have year one year two and we'll actually say now okay because at the end of the day the teacher wants to know what will the population be in two years and to avoid confusion we're going to call that year two and we're going to go through a little calculation where we're taking into account the fact that now we have 310 million right now we want to find out what are we going to have in the next year well basically you would have 310 million plus one percent of itself so actually i'm going to write that i'm going to write that inside here we're going to have 310 million plus one percent of itself. Now I'm just going to get this over with. 1% of 310 million would be this. That's 1% in decimal form times 310 million. All right, so to be clear about that, and when you go through the motions with this, uh, this is going to be 3,100,000. So really, this becomes. 310 million plus 3 million 100,000 and of course you could use your calculator for all this stuff and when you add those together you're going to get the following you're going to get this you're going to get 313,100,000. So that's what you get for year one. You know, we started here and then we took 1% of this, added it on top of this, and we ended up with that. All right. I'm going to draw these little brackets around here, parentheses, so we can really understand that this is what we end up with after year one. So we're going to have to do the same process with this, where we take 1% of this and then add it on top of this. So on the next section, I'm going to write that. And we're going to definitely add 1% of that to itself, right? So that's going to be 0 0.01 times itself. 100,000 and uh, there's a more succinct way of going about this but I think this is a good way uh, to reveal the mechanics in a sense of what's happening here where uh, again we're starting with what we had in year one you know what's this and then we're going to add one percent of itself on top of it so on the next line we could be very clear about what one percent of 313,100,000 is. And that again, you know, it's really what I did over here. That's going to be a matter of just moving the decimal place over in that direction. So you're moving it over twice, so that's going to become this 3,000,000. 1,000. All right, now, once I add these two, I actually have the answer, and that would be 
one as follows, and that is definitely going to be the answer, and that is denoted right here. All right, so once again, quick recap we started with 310 million. At the end of the day, they wanted to know what will the population be in two years, seeing as how it increases by one percent point per year. Well, we found out what it would be in year one, and we discovered it was going to be this, and then we had to take one percent of that, add it to itself, and then we end up with that. Now, as a lot of you home watching might realize, probably the most likely mistake that students would make is taking the original amount and then taking 2% of that and then adding that on top of 310, um, you know, million. All right, so you want to be careful not to do that. Anyway, moving on. All right, so they say, what is the median of the following sets? All right, well, the median is the middle number once you put all these in order. So a decent idea would be to actually just write them in order, all right? and uh, keep it simple in that regard. So we have 11, we have 13, looks like it's 14, then 26, then 35, and then 39. So a uh, good idea to actually count the numbers too. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Once again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And let's make sure we did it right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Good. Okay, so it's an even amount of numbers. So you can sort of take into account these four, take into account these four with the knowledge that the answer is going to be the average of the two middle terms, okay? So if you want to find the median, and it so happens that you have an even amount of terms, you just find the average of the two middle terms. How do you find the average? Well, uh, that would just be a matter of adding 13 plus 14, and then dividing by two, and that would give you 13.5, all right? So for my student at home, just remember, if it's an even amount of numbers, take the average of the middle two and I say you know what why don't we contrast that with a scenario where you don't have an even amount of numbers for example if these were the numbers that they gave you then you would uh, literally take the middle one because you have five numbers that's an odd amount of numbers and if you want the median you literally focus on the middle one all right so I think that should probably be clear to my student. Let's go on to the next one, number six. Okay, so by the way, that is this one. All right, so number six says, consider the following array of scores on a standardized test. One thing I noticed right away is that these scores are written in ascending order, which is very nice of them. We had to rewrite this in ascending order, but they were nice enough to write all of these already for us in ascending order. That's actually important because it looks like it's a percentile problem. It says the 15th percentile is given by which score? Okay, so if you want to find the percentile, uh, you have to usually uh, sort the data from smallest to largest. And like I just said, they've already done that for us. And then you have to find what they refer to as the locator. And the locator is given by this equation. All right, so there is a nice way of going about this. L equals P over 100 times N. Now, P is the percentage, and N is the number of you know items that you're dealing with. All right, now, this is either going to give you a whole number, or it's not going to give you a whole number. If it gives you a whole number, then L is the whole number. If it's not a whole number, then L is uh, the result of rounding up, all right? So let's actually just use this equation right now. So we have L equals, it's going to be 15 over 100 times N. Now N is the number of items you're dealing with. 
it is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 times 2 is 12, and then 13. So we have this. All right, and after going through the motions here, you're going to end up with, uh, let's see, 1.95. And as I had mentioned before, if you do not get a whole number, then you have to round up. So that rounds up to 2. And that gives us the locator, which means that we are focusing on 1 and 2. Right there, 410. 410 is the answer. All right, that's how you do that. Moving on. All right. How many pairs of items can be created by choosing one item from a group of M items and one item from a group of N items? Right. So that's kind of like saying, you know, imagine this is kind of a strange scenario, but imagine license plates were only two characters and you wanted to figure out, and by the way, it's characters like zero through nine over here and zero through nine over here. So it's numbers, all right, a number here and a number there. And, you know, we have these two character license plates. Now, if you had a problem that was asking you how many total license plates could you make from, you know, a two character scenario, well, all you'd have to do is sort of draw these underlines that represent each character and then ask yourself, um, what are, you know, how many possibilities are there for the first character? Well, that, are, that would actually be 10 because if you think about it, it would be, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and that would end up being 10 uh, total possibilities, including 0. And this would also be 10 possibilities, including 0. Now, as my student at home probably remembers, what you can do to find out how many license plates uh, you could create from two characters, you would just multiply these. All right, and then you would end up with 100. There are literally 100 license plates that you could create if each license plate only had two characters and you only had zero through nine to choose from. Once again, draw the underlines, write in how many possible outcomes go on top of each underline, and then multiply across. By the way, that's called the fundamental counting principle. All right, so that is sort of helpful to know because that's essentially what they're asking here. How many pairs of items can be created by choosing one item from a group of M items and one item from a group of N items. So in other words, you know, here's the choosing of the first thing, here's the choosing of the second thing. How many options do we have over here? Well, M, so there are M possibilities here. How many possibilities are there over here? Well, according to the problem, there are N possibilities. And what are we gonna to do to figure out how many pairs can be created? You're gonna multiply these guys. So that is exactly why number two is the answer. All right, moving on. From there, let's take a look. What is 200 factorial over 198 factorial? Okay, so my student knows by now that like 10 factorial, that's equal to 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5, blah, 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 all the way to, you know, times 2 times 1. Now we keep going. Uh, now, the test is being a bit tricky because it's giving you these big numbers, 200 factorial and 198 factorial. And the good news is there will be a nice way of canceling stuff. All right, so it's 200 factorial all over 198 factorial. Now, we all know that 200 factorial would be 200 times 199 times 198 times 197 right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And 198 factorial would really be 198 times 197, et cetera, et cetera. And as some of you at home probably noticed, this is the good news item, the fact that these will all cancel each other out, right? Uh, another way of writing it, to be honest, that might be sort of helpful is to just recognize that 200 factorial, I mean, that's really, you know, 200, times 199 times literally 198 factorial, right? Because what is 198 factorial? Well, it is all this stuff, right? 198 factorial is all of this stuff. So, you know, one way of thinking about it also is that 200 factorial over 198 
factorial really equals 200 times 199 times 198 factorial and that's all over what 198 factorial and that cancels with that in the exact same way that this would all cancel with that so what we are left with and we'll just focus here what we are left with is this lovely oh, that's a little messy looking but that's okay we're gonna leave it what we're left with there is 200 times 199 as a result of focusing on this because everything else canceled out and that is going to give you 39,800 so that is going to give you this alright and that is most definitely represented in the answer choice right there okay so moving on what is the probability that of two people selected at random at least one was born on a Friday well I think it's important to understand that probability is really the desired outcome over the possible outcome it is often the case that it's more useful to figure out what the possible uh, outcomes are before you move on to the desired outcomes so in other words what's the sample space in other words what are the possible you know pairings that could happen if you choose two people and one way to think about it is you know you're gonna have maybe the first person born on Monday second person born on Tuesday um, we could all say first person born on Monday second person born on Monday first person born on Monday second person born on Wednesday this is a way of going about it you know and you could like literally list all of the combinations uh, as you can probably see this would be very uh, tedious and we don't want to waste too much time so what we could do is we could take advantage of the fundamental counting principle which is the principle that we had just spoken of in an earlier problem where you know you know you're gonna be picking one person and you're gonna be picking another person so what are the possible how many possibilities I should say are there for the picking of the first person well that's gonna be seven possibilities because you know it's gonna be Sunday through Saturday you could say right so there's seven per possible you know outcomes when it comes to the first person there's also gonna be seven possible outcomes when it comes to the next person so you know without question it's gonna be seven times seven and that equals 49 now 49 is the uh, denominator because it's always probabilities can be desired over possible well we just figured out the possible pairings that could occur that is 49 but now we have to ask ourselves how many of the desired outcomes uh, are there and we put that in the numerator well once again we're looking for uh, at least one person born on a Friday so in other words uh, we're looking for the pairings that would feature you know the first person being born on Friday and uh, you know we'll say first person born on Friday we'll say second person born on Friday that's another group that we need to take into account and then there's another group where both people are born on Friday right because you could take into account all the groups where the first person's born on Friday you could take into account all the people who are such that the second person is born on Friday and then finally there is like the one pairing out of all 49 where both people are born on Friday so the question is how many of these are there how many are there such that you know the first person is born on Friday and the second person's not born on Friday well really uh, that there would be six of those because we need to take into account the fact that this could be Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Saturday or Sunday so that's six possibilities for the second one so that's a way of understanding how many in this group uh, there would be and for the exact same reasons this would be six also because uh, if you think about this empty slot could be Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Saturday and Sunday so that it's six possibilities it could be Monday Friday Tuesday Friday Wednesday Friday Thursday Friday Saturday Friday uh, Sunday Friday so that's six possibilities and then finally there's this one left over where it so happens that both people are born on Friday so that's gonna be six plus six plus it's looking like it's going to be one possibility here so that is most definitely going to be uh, 13 um, pairings that are such that at least one person is born on Friday so that will be 13 over 49 also known as 13 divided by 49 so I hope that makes sense once again 
um, when you want to figure out the desired ask yourself what are the different groups that could take place there's the group that is such that the first person's born on friday there's the group that is such that the second person's born on friday and then there is just literally the one pair where both people are, are born on friday and then you just figure out how many groups are in each camp all right um you know how many possible pairings you know uh what is it um could be described by these you know rules by these parameters in a way all right so that's a way of going about that all right, moving on to number 10. A basketball player makes 20% of her three-point shots and 40% of the two-point shots. Based on the information, what's the expected value of one shot? Okay, so if you want to find the expected value, uh, we'll just write E equals. Well, that's going to be the amount of points you get for whatever uh, particular shot you're dealing with times the probability of making that shot, you know. Uh, we'll call it, you know, the points for uh, a particular kind of shot, we'll call A, times the probability of that kind of shot also, we'll call that A. Um, and then you're going to add that to the amount of points you get for the other kind of shot, we'll call it shot B, and we're going to multiply that times the probability of getting shot B. So on the next line, we could write E equals, and uh, let's focus on uh, three-point shots first. So, of course, you get three points for every three-point shot. The probability of getting that is going to be 20%, also known as 0.2. So you're going to want to put that in decimals. And the amount of points you get for the second kind of shot is two points, and the probability of getting that kind of shot, according to the information, is 0.4. So that will be, you know, 0.6 plus 0.8 also known as 1.4 and that would be the answer which is right here 1.4 now what it, this basically means is even though it's literally impossible to get 1.4 points on a shot in basketball you know because there's either two point shots or one point shots or three point shots because um, I think it's one point for the free throws if I'm not mistaken uh, it's literally impossible to get 1.4 points on one shot but at the end of the day if you um, you know, take into account 20% chance of getting a three-point shot, 40% chance of getting a two-point shot, in the long run, um, this basketball player averages out to earning 1.4 points per shot, okay, in the long run, all right? The average score, the average points this basketball player makes per shot ends up shaking out to be 1.4 points per shot. So that's how you're going to want to tackle that one. All right, looking at number 11. Four people are voting for the type of beverage to be served at a picnic. The choices are those which could be among the valid preference ballots for this vote. Okay, so one thing worth noticing is that it says select two that apply. So we know that there's going to be two answers. Let's analyze one at a time. So uh, also worth noting is that there's four people, which means there should be four columns. Like this is the first person's preferences. This is the second person's preferences, third person and fourth person. So therefore, right away, we know that this one is wrong because there are five columns. All right, so that's gone. Let's look at this one. So you have to be really careful because as you can see here, ginger ale is listed twice when really it's a choice between cola, ginger ale, and iced tea. So that's gone because the idea is to list those three beverages according to your preference and whoever the last voter is. Uh, did not do it correctly. Okay, so... As you can see, there's four columns, and it looks like all three drinks are represented. So this one would work. Looking down here. Obviously, you can see how 
the numbers are kind of screwed up where it's like first place is in the middle row, second place is in the top row, but I'm not so sure that that really matters so much. I mean, there's still a first place, a second place, and a third place. So, okay, right here we have a third place and a third place, but no first place. And right here we have a second place and a second place, but no first place. So there's no first place rankings here, and that's a problem. All right, because you can't have just like a tie between different drinks. And uh, really by process of elimination, it says select the two that apply. We could circle this one. I do think it's worth noting that this is another one where the numbers, like the first place, second place, and third place are out of order. And since this one is one of the correct answers, it's worth making a mental note that Apparently, it doesn't really matter if you're writing it out of order as long as it's clear who the first place winner is, the second place winner, and the third place winner is. All right, so that's that one. All right, final problemo, at least for this video. The members of a class are holding an election to choose among four choices for a field trip. Their preference schedule is shown below. Okay, so using the board account method, which is the winning choice? Okay, so my student and I just reviewed the board account method recently, and I really, really like the board account method as a way of, you know, making everybody somewhat happy. Okay, if you have the preference ballots, where it's like, you know, first choice, second choice, third choice, fourth choice, and, um, you know, you do the board account method, it's a good way of ensuring that, you know, for the most part, people are gonna be happy with who won. Now, before we jump in, let's be clear, nine voters, not one voter, but literally nine voters had this ranking, had this preference ranking. So there are literally nine voters who like the zoo the most, the park the second best, farm the third best, and the museum the fourth best, there are eight voters who voted this way. There are six voters who voted this way and so on. Now, when you do the board account method, um, it's a good idea to start, sort of start from the bottom up in the sense that you want to associate points with these different rankings. So, for example, you could even actually extend this a little bit and again assigning points for the ranking and start from the bottom and always assign just one point because basically if like for example you know the museum got fourth place well since it's fourth place you really shouldn't give it that many points you know he only gets one point or the museum only gets one point in that case uh two points for third choice three points for second choice and four points for first choice all right so in other words we are rewarding the th things that got first choice okay by giving it four points and what you want to do then is you want to compare the candidates you want to find out how many uh points each candidate got so what I'm actually going to do right now is just write zoo colon because we're going to analyze it park colon because we're going to analyze it farm and museum. Then what I'm going to do is Maybe just draw these dividers so it doesn't get confusing. And um, maybe even do this too, actually. So the colon, whatever. Now I know that we're going to want to sort of analyze first place winnings, second place winnings, third place winnings, and fourth place winnings. And I know from experience that there is going to be a parentheses associated with each of these. This is going to be clear as we go, I think. 
I'm just setting it up in a relatively organized fashion so that it can be that much more systematic when I actually finish this problem. And again, I know I'm being somewhat vague, but I think you're gonna understand in a moment how this works. And this is really the beauty of the board account. Now, I'm only gonna analyze the points. First, I'm gonna write points first, and then the amount of voters next. So, um, first point, or first place winners get four points. So that's gonna be four, 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 four. Second place winners get three points, so that's gonna be three, 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 three. Third place winners get two points, so that's going to be two, 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 two. And fourth place winners get one point, so that's gonna be one, 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 one. I also know it's gonna be multiplication inside the parentheses, so I'm just gonna write all that. And now we will see what's going on with the board account. Now basically what you wanna do is analyze the zoos. And you ask yourself, the zoos got first place how many times? Well, nine times, according to this cell, right? There's no other zoos up here. The zoo got first choice nine times. So the number nine goes right here. How many times did the zoo get second place? Well, let's look at this row. Three times. The zoo got second place three times, so that's going to be a three. How many times did the zoo get third place? Well, let's look in the third place row. The zoo got third place eight times, so we're going to write eight right there. How many times did the zoo get fourth place? Well, let's look at the fourth place row. It's down here. We have six and also this one, so that's going to be a seven. I'm going to worry about the calculation later. I'd rather fill in the rest of this chart right now. Analyzing the park. How many times did the park get first place? Well, let's scan the top row. Uh, it didn't, right? It did not get first place ever, so we're going to call that zero. How many times did the park get second place? So look at the second place row. Park, uh, we have park represented in the first three cells. That's nine plus eight is 17 plus six is 23, so that's gonna be 23 votes. How many times did the park get third place? Well, let's look at the third place row. Uh, the park is right here and right here. It looks like four voters voted for the park as a third place winner. How many times did the park get fourth place? We'll look at the fourth place row. The park is not represented there at all, so that's gonna be a zero. Let's analyze the farm. How many times did the farm get first place? The farm got first place here and here. That's three plus one is four, so that's gonna be a four. How many times did the farm get second place? That's the second row. No farm represented in the second row, therefore that's gonna be a zero. How many times did the farm get third place? That's the third row. The farm is right here and the farm is right here. That's gonna be nine plus six is 15. So that is 15 right there. And how many times did the farm get fourth place? Well, that's the fourth row. The farm is only here. That's eight times. So that's going to be an eight right there. How many times did the museum get first place? Let's look at the top row. We've got this cell and this cell. Eight plus six is 14. That's 14. How many times did the museum get second place? Well, that's the second row right here. The museum only got second place one. There was one voter that voted for the museum to be second place. How many times did the museum get third place? Well, that's the third row. The museum is not represented there at all. That's gonna be a zero. How many times did the museum get fourth place? That's the fourth row. The museum is here and here. That is nine plus three, which is 12. All right, so. We filled in what we had to. Now, before I move on, let's be clear. What are we doing? <laughs> what did I just do? 
Well, you take the amount of points, you know, for first place and you multiply it by the number of people who voted for the zoo being first place. You take the amount of points that each of these would get for a second place win and you multiply that by the amount of voters that voted for the zoo for the second place win. And you get two points for a third place win. There are eight voters who voted for the zoo for third place and so on. All right, that's the way that you do it. And then you're going to extend these lines, right? And then maybe some equal signs are in order, seeing as how we are going to perform the calculation now. Let's be very careful. Four times nine is 36, plus another nine is 45, plus 16 is gonna be 55 plus six, which is 61 plus seven. 61 plus seven is 68. That is literally how many points the zoo got after all that, okay? The zoo, in a sense, won 68 points. All right, looking at the park, four times zero is zero. Three times 23 is three times 20, which is 60 plus nine, so that's 69 plus two times four is eight, 69 plus eight is 77 plus zero, so that's 77. So the park is in for the lead. All right, the farm is four times four is 16 plus zero plus 30, that's gonna be 46, plus eight, that's gonna be 54. And we have four times 14, that's 28, plus three is 31, plus zero, and 31 plus 12 is gonna be 43. Okay, so we have a winner. It is the park at 77. Now I'd like you to notice that, um, uh, let's see here, so the park won but notice how the park never got first place. Isn't that interesting? But the park still went one because most people kind of liked the park. You know, they didn't like it the best, but most people, they liked the park. You know, the park was hovering right around here, <laughs> right? Whereas the other choices were a bit polarizing. For example, you have a lot of people who like the zoo here, but you have a lot of people who hate the zoo here, and another person who hates the zoo here, right? All right, hopefully that makes sense. I just realized this is not the last problem of the video. We shall carry on to the next. All right. So, 13, if a candidate wins an election in a recount, one of the losing candidates withdraws, then the original winner should still win the election. This describes which voting criterion. Okay, so this is something that I'm going to talk to my student about. She's just gonna have to sort of remember these different criterion. Um, let's just make sure we understand what's happening here. So if a candidate wins an election in a recount, one of the losing candidates withdraws, then the original winner should still win the election. So imagine there's candidate A, candidate B, candidate C, candidate D. And let's say A like wins, and then um, after this person wins, D leaves the race. And according to the independence of irrelevant alternatives criterion, A should still be the winner. All right. A should still be the winner even after D, who was one of the losing candidates. You know, one of the losing candidates left. A should still be the winner. That's what this means. Now, here's the thing. It might seem obvious that that should be the way that it is. But interestingly enough, when you study voting mathematics and the mathematics of voting, I should say, there are certain situations, strangely, because literally no voting method is 100% perfect. There are some weird, wacky situations where if A won, you know, and then at, during a recount, D, you know, leaves, Occasionally, 
there are weird situations where that would strangely transfer the wind to, let's say, C or something. And what the independence of irrelevant alternatives says is that that shouldn't happen in an ideal universe. Okay, in a utopian ideal universe, we don't like it when that happens. Okay, that's essentially what this says. All right, I think this whole concept could, you know, have some more elaboration. Maybe that'd be helpful. But it seems like this question really just kind of uh, is testing your ability to generally understand what this generally means. So I'm not going to get into the details at this point. Maybe in another video I will. All right, anyway. That's 13. Moving on. Okay. Which method of apportionment might produce the Alabama paradox? So, when you learn about apportionment, one of the first things you learn is Hamilton's method. And Hamilton's method could lead to the Alabama paradox. Now again, I feel like that might be better for uh, another video if we're going to get into the details of that. I'll give you a brief explanation that um, let's say there's a country called country and there are three states in the country. All right. And let's also say that the country you know, has a government and it's got a Congress and there are 200 seats in the Congress. And um, country A has like a large population or state A has a large population, state B has a medium and state C has a small population. And what we realize is that after apportioning these 200 seats so that each of these states could be represented, uh, we end up with um, a certain apportionment. And let's say we use the Hamilton's method, which is beyond the scope of this video. Perhaps in the next video I could get into it. Um, let's say that C ends up with 50 seats. We could say B ends up with 60, and then A ends up with 90 seats. At the end of the day, after applying the Hamilton's method, but then let's say, you know, next year we have a new rule in government where there are now 201 seats. Well, you would think that you know that should result in all of these going up or something like that you know there should be like an increase certainly none of them should go down but what they found is when you apply the Hamilton's method every now and then it might run into a problem called the Alabama paradox where even though you went from 200 to 201 it's still going to result in one of these guys going down let's say this poor guy who's already got a smaller representative, state C, that might turn into 49. Like they actually might lose a seat. And then let's say this goes up to like 61 and then this goes up to uh, 91, something like that. So hopefully the math is correct there. Let's see, uh, nine plus one is 10 plus another one. Yeah, so that should work. Um, so basically, that's the Alabama paradox in that, you know, when you had 200, you had this scenario, and as soon as you increased one, this poor bastard, State C, actually lost a seat, which is kind of weird because you would think that when you increase the total number of seats that are available for the three states, uh, none of these states should lose a seat, you know. So anyway, that is, uh, again, an introduction to the Alabama paradox. Um, it'd be nice to explain in a separate video, like how the Hamilton method works and all that good stuff. But for now, we'll leave it at that. So that is 14. Moving on to 15. 
All right, which vertices have a degree of three? Okay, when it says degree of three, it means, you know, like, first of all, a vertex is one of these points, all right? And if it has a degree of three, that means that, like, the point has three things sticking out of it, <laughs> okay? It's the best way I could explain it. And you can really think of it as, like, three things sticking out of it, um, especially when you zoom in really close. So, for example, if you take a look at G and zoom in really close, I mean, clearly, you can see there's one, two, and three things sticking out of it. Therefore, G has a degree of three. All right? So you don't want to get thrown off by the fact that, yes, this goes in a circle, and since it's a single circle, should we count it as one thing? The answer is no. We should not count it as one thing, because what we're focusing on is what we would see if we zoomed in. We would see one thing going out, two things going out, and three things going out. So that's how the degree stuff works. Now, analyzing something like F, well, F has four things going out of it. This one, this one, this one, and this one. E has three things going out of it. It's one, two, three. D has three, right? C, for the same reason as E, has a degree of three. So therefore, there are three vertices with a degree of three. Starting with G, that's the first one I had mentioned, uh, E, D, and C. And C, looks like D is not mentioned, but that's fine. We're selecting the three that apply, and here they are. Okay, which graph has at least one Euler circuit? So you know that a graph has an Euler circuit when all the vertices are even. That's the rule. You know it has an Euler circuit when all the vertices are even. Done. Okay, that's lit literally the rule. Um, now, let's be clear very quickly. There's a difference between an Euler circuit and an Euler path. Okay, but just remember, if we're talking about the circuit, the only rule that you need to know is that all vertices must have an even degree. Okay? Now, if you're talking about an Euler path, it's a different rule. And that rule says that um, there can be either zero or two odd degrees. Okay, that's how you know if it has an Euler path. Zero or two odd degrees um, with the rest being even. But anyway... We're not dealing with that. We're dealing with the Euler circuit. So clearly this is gone. Why? Because I can already see that D has an odd degree of 1. Same thing with C. So we're done with this. All right. I see an odd degree here, right? E has an odd degree. Gone. Let's focus here. I see even degree, even degree, even degree, even degree, even degree. That's a good one. And I know that I just changed the page, but this is actually one of the answer choices as well. And this answer choice is gone. All right, so if you recall from the last slide, uh, answer choice three is the only one that works. This is gone because D is odd and C is odd. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Okay, next problem. What is the total weight of the Hamilton circuit? D, B, E, C, blah, 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 blah. All right, so basically you go along the path that they recommend, you know, it's like starting from D, then you go to B, then you go to E, then you go to C, then you go to A, then you go to D, and then you add up all the little numbers along the way, all the little distances along the way, right? So, you know, really, here's what I'm going to do to like save space. We're going to do these little upside down rainbows because each of these little upside down rainbows or arcs represent a trip that you take right so from D to B where's that that's this according to this that's 72 so I'm gonna write 72 and then from B to E that's from here to there that is 90 and then we got what is it, E from to C, so it's like, 
that's 72. And then we have from C to A, clearly 55, obviously. And then finally, we come back to where we began A to D. So that's gonna be like, boom, right there. That's 55. So we will definitely, definitely, definitely add all of these. And as a result, we get the lovely number of lovely number of 344 right there boom 344 when you add it all up okay so moving on to the next problem the chart below shows the distances between four cities A, B, C, and D. Uh, using the nearest neighbor method, I'm going to underline that, nearest neighbor method, starting at A, starting at A, that's important. What's the total distance, that's what we're trying to find, for the Hamilton circuit obtained? Okay, so we start at A, so we start here, and we'll focus on this column, and we're going to use the nearest neighbor method. So. First of all, Hamilton circuit, that means you're gonna hit every city. There's four cities called A, B, C, and D, and we have to hit every single city once, okay? And since it's a circuit, we have to end up back at A, all right? We start at A, we hit every city once, exactly once, and then we swing back to A. So we wanna know if you do that using the nearest neighbor method, what's the total distance? So the nearest neighbor method basically means that you're gonna to go to the closest city from where you are until you're sort of forced to do something else, okay? You're gonna do the closest city from where you are until you are, in a sense, forced to do something else. And that forced to do something else part is something that will become clear as we go. Nonetheless, let's start at A because that's the first city we're going to. Now, where are we gonna go? Well, it depends on who's the closest city. So if we're here, Apparently the closest city is C. That's only three miles away. In fact, I'm gonna write that right now. So now we're at C. So here we are at C. What's the closest city from C? Well, clearly A, it's only three miles away, but you know, we've, we've already been to A. And according to the Hamilton circuit, we have to hit every city exactly once. So we can't go back to A right now. We have to go to a different city. What's the closest city other than A? Well, that would be D, that is seven miles away. So we're gonna to go to D. Here's us going to D. That's seven miles away, and now we're at D. Now here's the thing, from D, there's only one city we haven't been to, and that would be B. So we have to go to B. We are forced to go to B. It doesn't even matter who's closest, who's not closest, we have to go to B. Now, it's only a coincidence that B happens to be closest, all right? So we're gonna go to B. Here's us going to B right now, and how far away is that? Well, according to the chart, that is six miles away. So now we're at B. Now, at this point, we've been to every city, so now it's time to go back home. It's time to go back to A. So from B, we're gonna go to A. Apparently, that's 12 miles away. And um, here's us swinging back around, going back to A, and we are recognizing that that is 12 miles. So how far do we travel? Well, all you have to do is add all the distances up and then you are done. So that's gonna be three plus seven is 10, plus six is 16, plus 12 is 28. That is the answer, my friends. That's how you do it. Hamilton circuit. The Hamilton means that you have to hit every city once. The circuit part means that you have to end up back where you started. We started at A, we hit every city once, we ended up back where we started. Anyway, hope that's helpful for you guys. Uh, hope that's helpful. For my students, of course, I believe it will be. And, um, you know, if I made any careless mistakes or what have you, go ahead, comment below, and we can work as a team to make sure that uh, this is helpful for people. And I will see you soon. Thanks for watching.